Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming to this session. Uh, I would like to present to you Dan Bielefeld. Dan, take it away, please. Thank you. Okay. In North Korea, um, those in trouble with the authorities sometimes disappear and are never seen again. Others are publicly executed, but their bodies are not returned to their families. For the last four years, we at the Transitional Justice Working Group have interviewed over seven, uh, excuse me, 600 North Koreans who have escaped from their country and then resettled in South Korea. So we're doing our work in Seoul. Uh, we focus on documenting three main types of sites. Uh, one, where are the victims of the government? Where are they killed? Where are they buried? And then where are documents that might be related to all of this? So just very really briefly, I'm gonna talk about know a little bit about our project over the last four and a half years, give a bit of background on the issue, um, why we're doing this, and how our group and project started, and our goals, and then um, get into the meat, which is you know using free and open source software uh, to do our work, and also using open data uh, to do our work. And we'll talk a little bit about challenges and next steps. Okay, so first, um, a bit of background. Um, on my screen, it's moving, but on your screen, it's not. Okay, well, y here we go. All right, so um, the in, uh, in 2013, the UN uh, Human Rights Council uh, created what they call a Commission of Inquiry, a COI, that investigated the uh, human rights situation in, the North, in North Korea, the DPRK, the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea. Um, we don't have time to go over their findings very much, but just very briefly, if you had been following what had been, what's been going on in North Korea, there was not a whole lot new in the report, but if you had not been following what had been going on and then you were to read this, it's quite shocking. Um, so, um, it said, for instance, the gravity scale and nature of these violations reveal a state that does not have any parallel in the contemporary world. Um, and the bottom there, uh, the report called for accountability for those, quote, uh, most responsible for the crimes against humanity. So that was our um, call to action. And in uh, late 2014, uh, several activists, North Korean human rights activists in South Korea, uh, started a new organization called the Transitional Justice Working Group. Um, the head of it is from South Korea, one of our original founders, and the interviewer, or our interviewer for the first three years of our project, originally himself was from North Korea. Then there's a Canadian guy, there's somebody from the UK, and then myself, I'm from the US. Um, and now our staff um, is about half and half Korean and, and foreign or, or international. Um, moving quickly, um, and I will provide links uh, to that report, for example, the COI um, at the end. I'll provide links for the things I'm mentioning. Um, so what is transitional justice? Um, this is, uh, this is uh, to try and very quickly describe it uh, is difficult, but basically it's the idea of um, how does a society after a period of systemic widespread you know, human rights abuses and then there's been a tr now there's a transition. Either the government itself has changed its nature and reformed, or there's a different government. But nonetheless, how do the people in that society, after the transition, how do they move forward and try and you know heal uh, and find reconciliation um, and also perhaps justice? Um, and it's a different answer for every society. But there are definitely, if you study history, there are definitely some better approaches and some other approaches that really didn't work well. Um, so these are some of the mechanisms. Don't have time to talk about it very much. Um, but um, one thing I want to point out is that we, in our approach, we very much try to be victim-centered. So, and oftentimes in these, even when these types of mechanisms are implemented and there, there's a lot of well-meaning uh, action going on, oftentimes, uh, you know, the victims' voices or the the families, family members of the victims, they, they often get uh, sort of set aside or they don't, so we try and, um, we want to be able to amplify their voices and make sure that they're heard. Um, now, moving on. 
So the goals of our mapping project, um, as you know, the COI called for accountability for the, 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 those most responsible, i.e. those at the top. Um, so at some point in the future, there probably, and it's not certain, but there probably will be some sort of a trial or a series of trials. Um, so we want to start gathering evidence for that or ga gathering um, uh, victims' stories or victim family members' stories now. Uh, we also want to help family members learn the final whereabouts of their loved ones. Um, there are many, many uh, goals. I, s many of these actually are for things in the future, but I also want to point out that definitely we're using the information we collect now to do advocacy right now. So, for example, we're going to, in, uh, in this October, we're going to go to New York, and uh, the UN General Assembly has a, um, we'll be discussing a resolution on North Korea then, so we want to, um, you know, get, we, we, we're advocating on uh, behalf of the victims um, um, now. Okay, let me continue. All right, so we came out with a report. Uh, this is our first report after two years. Uh, we were very fortunate we had great uh, media coverage, including the New York Times, Ars Technica, Washington Post. There were lots of other uh, coverage in other languages. Um, then we came out to uh, this this year, just two months ago, we came out with um, our second report. Uh, you may have seen it sitting over there. You can pick up if you haven't already. Uh, well, maybe maybe they've al already been picked up, which is quite all right with me. Um, I have another copy here, anyone who didn't get one. And there is also like some infographics. There are plenty of those over there as well. Um, so please pick up one of those on your way out if you haven't already. Um, and then also you can download the PDF uh, from our website. I'll show that link near the end. Um, so moving on to the heart of the talk, that was the background. Here are the main tools we use in our mapping work. Um, we don't exclusively use uh, FOSS, I guess, because we are using Google Earth, which is you know obviously not an open program, but it does provide us access to the um, to a lot of imagery that we you know which is great for us. Um, I should explain how our interview process works. The not me, but one of my coworkers sits down with an interviewee, and they have Google Earth in front of them. And as they're talking, if they say, for example, that they did see a public execution, and by the way, like it's well over fifty percent of the people we interview have seen them. Uh, it's quite common in North Korea. Um, this is a way to instill fear. Um, then anyway, then we ask, oh, you have seen a public execution. Are you able to find it here on the imagery? Um, and if they are able to do so, then we record those points um, in Google Earth. Um, and then the accompanying information right now, we're currently recording that in uh, spreadsheets, the, you know, the rest of the, 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 the narrative of the report. Um, but we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, then... The good stuff, uh, yeah, we use Postgres and PostGIS, which is definitely a, a match made in heaven, I think. Um, and we do, you know, I, we, we do some analysis in there. What else? We do a lot of, you know, querying. We do counting. Um, for our most recent report, I started playing around with clustering. I had not um, done that before, but that was, um, depending on which version of PostGIS you have, it actually can be pretty easy. It's pretty cool. Um, and then we then moving into QGIS, we do use that um, obviously for a lot of the visualization um, and more analysis, and um, we can you know bring in base maps and it, uh, that we've acquired. Uh, there's another organization that had published some some of their research with they published a KML file of some of their research, so you know we can look at it and see how their their research and our research overlap or don't overlap. Uh, we make our maps in QGIS. Um, and, okay, so why do we use FOSS? Um, for us, surely, obviously, the, the price was a factor. Um, and also, I had formerly worked, I had previously, a long time ago, I'd worked in the States in IT, so I was aware of very much of the vendor lock-in issue. And um, we had looked into uh, ESRI, what is it, GIS, 
um, at the time, four years ago, they had a, they probably still do, I don't know, they have like a, 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 a non-profit license for $100 a year. Well, we don't have a lot of money, but we do have that much money, so we could afford that. But thinking about it more, I was like, well, a little bit edgy because I don't remember exactly what's uncovered in that license, but, but it, the fir we don't really know exactly where our project's going to go. This is a decision, you know, not just for this year, but it's the, 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 the duration of the project, which may be a long time, unfortunately. So, um, so it's a, budget, a budgeting issue for us in the future also. So we, you know, if we, have, if we discover we need more functionality and we have to pay more, a lot more for that, that could, be, that could impact us. So um, anyway, we're, so these are the reasons we initially uh, came to start using uh, you know, f these FOSS products, but then I discovered some, another reason that I had no idea about until a couple years later. Two years ago, I went to my first FOSS for G in Boston, and I suddenly discovered, you know, this community, um, and this, this, uh, this was wonderful. Um, so, you know, I'm sure, you know, other, you know, there are other proprietary communities out there, but anyway, this was, this was, uh, this was great for me. Um, and, being able to you know send you know emails to the mailing you know mailing lists and have developers reply that was pretty exciting for me the first time I did that um, with you know very helpful timely information for me um, that was great um, so okay it's not just uh, open software we're using we are using some open data um, as mentioned we use you know we use data the the imagery from Google Earth I should say that the historical imagery did I, I don't think I mentioned this earlier the historical imagery is great for us because like if if this is a public execution that happened you know 15 years ago then if we can go back and look at an image that was you know from approximately that time that provides better um, you know it, it's better for the interviewer to be able to look at that than something that you know is just from now um, but anyway, so for open, uh, open data, we, we love OpenStreetMap, we use it. Some of you, I'm sure in this room, some of you must be probably contributors, so thank you. Um, and if anyone has contributed to the North Korean version of OpenStreetMap, or the, that part of OpenStreetMap, you know, double thank you to you. Um, we're definitely making use of it. Um, please continue. And I also wanted to acknowledge this uh, project, yeah, Global Administrative Areas, which we've made use of too. Okay, challenges. Um, yeah, there are lots of them. Um, but this is a mapping conference, so let's talk about some of the challenges of making maps. Um, we, first of all, we cannot publish coordinates for some of the sites that we record because um, if, it's a, if it's a killing site, a public execution site, or if it's a, um, a burial site, especially burial sites, we, we don't want to publish that because the regime then would just say like, oh, well, they, they would just easily, if they want to, they would just go and remove the evidence, clean it up. Um, now, they, of course, for all of these sites, they know where they are, but that list is like this long, and our list is maybe this long, so it would be a big shortcut for them if they know what we know, and if they know that then, and they clean all that up, you know, then we have nothing. So we, it's really important that we don't reveal some of the, rest, the, the, the specific locations. But so that has obviously implications for the maps that we can make. Uh, so we, we've approached this two different ways. Um, so here is a map from our most recent report. And anyway, this is, yeah, reports of uh, riverbanks uh, riverbank public execution sites. So we hear these are real points, but what we're not telling you is where in North Korea this happened. So we have basically what we're doing is we're, we're publishing a map without any thing that tells you where it happened. Um, but those points are, you know, as they, as we recorded them in our, you know, as, as the uh, interviewees told us to them, told them to us. Um, so relatively they're all, it's, it's a true map, but there's just, only one feature that we, we had to, we felt we had we couldn't just make it completely blank we had to put something in there so that that's a real river right there um, but that's it um, so that's you know it's not as exciting as a map as it could be um, one other point uh, not about the mapping but just in terms of the data shown here um, just a side note this is uh, we, basically these reports of public executions 
cover at least one execution or one report from each decade starting in the 1960s going right through to the current decade. Um, and um, yeah, there's, it's like this site has been very active. Um, another way that we approach this is to aggregate the data. So instead of you know, putting points on a map, now we just aggregate and we publish a, um, a province map. So the left map is from our first, uh, I'm sorry, from our second report and then the right hand is from the um, first report. Uh, we had different approaches. I'd like to talk more about these differences, um, but I think for the sake of time, I need to move on. But um, yeah, so aggregating. Um, other challenges. Oh, before I move on to other challenges, I do want to say we don't, there are some sites that we publish coordinates of. So here, for example, this is, as it says, yeah, possible repositories of documentary evidence. This is from our most recent report. And we uh, similarly, we published for a different town, we published uh, these suspected sites or sites that we suspect will have, you know, documentary evidence, um, you know, police stations, court, I don't know, actually market, that's not. I mean, we just put that up there for reference. That's not suspected of having documents. But um, on the left here, this is China. So this is very northern, uh, or this is northern North Korea. Um, so, and w a, yeah, a document site is basically a police station, a you know military installation, something like that. Um, all right, moving on. Another challenge we have is data security. Um, this is, uh, I mean, the North Koreans are, you know, they put a lot of resources into their cyber weaponry, if you will. Um, so partly just to make money for the regime, they like they steal money from like the bank, the Bank of Bangladesh or something, and get seventy million bucks. You know, they do. I think that was maybe two years ago. I'm probably wrong on the figure. It might be higher, but anyway, they they make uh, they make money, but they they spend some of their uh, cyber, they, they devote some of their cyber resources to um, to, uh, you know, targeting North Korean human rights groups and activists and uh, escapees um, trying to get, you know, get their credentials for, the, you know, fish their email credentials so they can get into their email or sometimes, you know, even worse, you know, basically malware, uh, spyware attacks, things like that. Um, so one thing that was a challenge for us was um, the mapping community doesn't know a lot about digital security. N that's not completely true, but of most of the people I've met. And then the digital security experts I've met, they don't know a lot about mapping. So it was kind of up to us to figure out how to put that all together. Um, another thing I want to say that I should say in terms of like working with the FOSS communities is that the, one of the, the strengths, the biggest strength obviously is the openness of the community. But because of our threat model, Sometimes we can't really always be open about everything that we'd like to be open about. Um, so one, exa one quick example of this is like, okay, so I'm using some FOSS software, I love it, and then suddenly I get an error, and it says, would you like to report this? And like, well, normally, if I don't have the threat model I do, I would just say, yes, I want to help the project. I want this feedback to get back to the developer so it helps me and it helps the community. But it's, it's really way more complicated to figure out, like, to, to narrow down, to know that, I'm not sending anything that could identify me or my network. Um, so that's just one example of how there's a tension, a bit of a tension there between um, the you know open working openly and um, threat model we have. Uh, moving on, um, next steps. Um, the next thing I'm going to be working on is uh, we need to make a custom application or something to replace the spreadsheets that we have. It's not a really a, an efficient way to work. Um, and um, so there are different ways that we could go about this. You know, there are all kinds of, you know, browser-based applications that are represented here um, or others. You know, we, maybe we could use QGIS forms. Maybe we could make a custom QGIS plugin. I don't know. This is something that, this is one of the big questions I have here this week. Um, we want to get into digitizing around the sites we record. Um, in other words, we want to be able to say something like, um, in, in a future report, maybe if, if we're doing more digitizing, we, maybe we then could say something like, you know, X number of reports of public executions happened within Y meters of a public, you know, market or of a school, something like that. Um, and then drones. But, yeah, but right now, can't make our own, get our own imagery because 
not only the North Korean government, but the South Korean government, they don't want us doing that. So um, then, um, and just to wrap up, um, so our, our organization, the head of our group uh, is very much into collaborating with other groups. And anyway, we, that has best definitely been our approach. Uh, so we have worked with a lot of different, uh, a lot of, you know, specialists in a lot of different fields. It's very inter interdisciplinary. Um, so, you know, if, if you have an idea that maybe I haven't thought of, or if you um, are interested and you just want to talk, you know, please find me, whether it's now or I'll be here the rest of the week, um, or send me an email. Um, and I look forward to collaborating and talking and, and, and learning with you. Thank you very much, and I will leave with some links and then have some Q&A. I know that you mentioned that having the time series for the identification of the locations for the relatives or the victims of the relatives is important. Why choosing? You said that um, having an imagery from a previous previous period was important. Was there any other factors that led to the choice of Google Earth as of other things, or how do the uh, you know would the people find other types of map helpful? Uh, good question. It, for that, it's just that's the, the, the main thing that we're aware of that we can get in real time because we don't necessarily know where the person is going to be, uh, you know, if, where exactly. Because the, they, maybe they came from this hometown and we might, know, we might know that before the interview, but then maybe they start telling us about something over here. So we don't, you know, we can't really preload stuff. We need, we need to have, you know, real time be able to like go wherever the imagery can, t you know, w find imagery for that place that they tell us if that makes sense. Um, but so with Google Earth, that's, but if there are other sources that are out there like that, or something that we, where we could just download all of North Korea for all the imagery and just get all of it. And then, you know, once a month update it or something, or once a year, whatever, that would be great. Yeah. Um, but for right now, that's where we're at. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead, or I'll repeat your question. I, we did actually at Phosphor G t in two years ago. I did talk with them some um, with Digital Globe. I'm sorry. The question was, did we talk to Digital Globe um, about, for example, using getting free imagery from them? They have a time slider. Um, we did talk with them. Yeah, a, a few years ago. I, now that's a good question, and I think I should revisit that. Um, if we can get, like, again, we would need to be able to get something ahead of time and get, like, because my understanding of the way they work is you, you sort of tell them, okay, here's a sector, you download all that. Um, but if I could just download all of North Korea, that would be awesome. But I don't know, like. I think you can just consume it as a service. So they'll, they'll, they'll provide a. Oh, so. so like a cleansed kind of view of the world that's got the best of all the imagery. Uh huh. And you can just consume that as a service and then just slide back so you wouldn't have to download anything potentially. Okay. So, yeah, that, that might work for you. Okay. That, that sure. No, and I, actually, this is, this is good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. More questions? We have a couple minutes, maybe. Oh, yeah. You mentioned spatial clustering. Have you done any temporal clustering to look and see if there's patterns in when the deaths have happened, if it was something to do with politics or a region? Okay, that's a great question. Um, we have not done anything with temporal clustering or the, one of the challenges is we, the data, like especially for the older, um, the, the memories that when someone is telling us something that happened 10, 20 years ago, um, usually the date we get is, you know, very vague. Um, so, you know, it could be, if we're lucky, it's kind of like in this year, in, in this season, in this year. Um, but even that, for something like what you're talking about, that actually might, it could work if you're trying to look at political things. Um, we haven't done that yet, but we're, I think we're starting to get to a point where we're getting more data now. We have over, you know, 600 interviews. And um, so that type of a thing, yeah, I think we, one of the things 
one of the questions that we really are interested in, but we have a hard time from our data discerning, and that's partly just the way we were collecting it, so we're going to try to adjust when we restart interviews soon after, you know, after this report came out, we've taken a break, but is uh, one of the questions is what um, are, are the number of public ex the number of public executions are they going down or up you know like those types of things or regionally how are they doing and we don't because we don't we don't have a random sample so it's we we and we can't nobody has a ran random sample so it's really hard to do that but we're going to try and ask more what would it be quali qualitative questions you know better better questions to try and get at that to, at people's sense of it anyway. Um, you know, moving forward, but thank you. Hey, uh, one, uh, one last question. Anyway. Uh, I, I saw this guy first. Uh, when the results from the interviews, do you digitally encode and, and map information that's been pull out, pulled out through some sort of ethnographic process? Have you looked at starting to map those, uh, you know, starting to get that quali uh, qualitative uh, information? So if you, I imagine when you're uh, engaging with someone in an interview like that, they might start to refer to places about other things. Um, they, might, they might talk about lots of different experiences in their life. Um, it's, not, it's not my background at all, but I've worked with people that done it to try and maybe you want to tease out a number of threads as well as you know, the locations or time of a, of a specific event. They may allude to other things. Um, I'm a previous life have been interested in uh, digitally capturing that information because you may have people that talk about the same thing but you don't realize it at the time when you're in the interview and that there is but it's quite it's an area of active research of then to try and map that but it's it's very hard because it's not hard it's not fixed quantitative data yeah thank you uh, i'd like to talk to you afterwards about that if it's possible thank you um and one of the challenges real quick has been trying to somebody tells us about a report and it's pretty it's here and then somebody else tells us about a report and it's pretty near there but figuring out was were they at the same event or not because the the dates are so vague it's really hard to tell and deduplicate uh event data um okay thank you all right uh well um you're you going to stick around afterwards for, yeah, for the questions okay great all right um well dan thank you very much ladies and gentlemen a round of applause dan bielefeld thank you very thank much you.